Okay, Shana Tova. What did I just say? <laughs> Who knows? Shana, uh, no? Close? Shana Tova. Huh? Even closer. We're getting there. Your mother wears bra. Yeah, no, no, no. No, that's not even close. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, roughly Happy New Year. So why am I wishing you a Happy New Year in the fall? Okay, today is Shana Tova. Today is uh, actually Rosh Hashanah, uh, the head of the year, and the new year according to the Jewish calendar, and it is the beginning of a special 10-day season in the Hebrew calendar known as the High Holy Days, or the Days of Awe. And that's what I would like to talk to you about today. Um, seems appropriate for this time of the year. Last night at sundown uh, began Rosh Hashanah. So um, uh, as Christians, our familiarity is more with the New Testament than it is with the Old Testament. But the Apostle Paul said that all these things were written down for our own instruction and learning. Uh, referring to the Old Testament. And so there are certain things about the Old Testament good for us to reflect upon. And so uh, I like to keep uh, in mind the events that are happening according to the Old Testament calendar, not that I'm legally bound by any of them, but they are reminders to me of certain biblical truths. So we are entering upon this period of time known as the High Holy Days. And so today is um, the beginning of the Hebrew calendar. It is the new year, and today in particular is called Rosh Hashanah. Now these days are particularly days of remembrance. And we have in our churches an opportunity to have special days of remembrance, and particularly, particular we have the Lord's Supper. How many had the Lord's Supper yesterday in their church? Many, many churches. First Sunday of the month, that's um, when they have the Lord's Supper. Of course, the Bible didn't tell us that we had to do it on the first Sunday of the month. That's just become kind of tradition. In fact, the Bible doesn't tell us how often to celebrate the Lord's Supper. But the Lord did know that we needed a periodic reminder. We needed to have a time in our lives when we would stop from the regular course of our lives and just ponder and think and remember. And so he gave us the Lord's Supper for that reason. Well, similarly, he gave Israel certain times of remembrance, and this is one of them, the High Holy Days. It's a time when the, the people of Israel were to stop, to think, and to remember, and to reflect. And I want to talk to you about what that means for us as we remember then what God gave the nation of Israel. So it begins with Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah comes around once a year. It is the new year. That's what Rosh Hashanah means. And the High Holy Days end 10 days later with Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And that will come about Wednesday of next week. So a total of 10 days, the High Holy Days, also known as the Days of Awe. We serve an awesome God. Amen? An awesome God. And these are the days of awe. They're time for us to remember that he is a God of great awe, holiness, power, and claim on each of our lives. So for Rosh Hashanah, our text is Leviticus 23. And it simply says this, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest. So first of all, it was a day set aside for rest, okay? A day to abstain from the normal activities so that there's time to reflect. A day of solemn rest, a memorial. So a time to remember, it is a memorial. And uh, there are certain things in particular that were, that were to be remembered in connection with Rosh Hashanah. A memorial proclaimed with the blast of the trumpets. And um, uh, Timothy asked me, well, what would you like to sing for chapel this morning? And at first I said one thing, and I got to thinking about it. I said, no, let's sing that one that starts out with the, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more. Because today is the day for the blowing of the trumpet. 
And uh, so that's, that's what uh, happens on Rosh Hashanah, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. You shall present a food offering to the Lord. Okay, that's our text for the beginning of the days of awe. And the ending of the days of awe come with Yom Kippur. Now, there's a detailed description in Leviticus 16. There's a summary of it here in Leviticus 23. Let's take a look at this one. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Now on the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day. So again, it's a, it's a memorial, it's a time of rest, it's an offering of food offering for the Lord. Verse 28 says, you shall not do any work on that very day, for it's a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. Now this affliction, it's not talking about uh, uh, whipping yourself or beating yourself up, but it is, is a time of introspection, a time of the examination of your heart, and of your mind, and I lost my feed here. What happened? <laughs> well, we'll get it back here in a second. Let's just try going like this. Okay. So, it is a time to afflict yourselves, a time for introspection, for examination of the heart, and uh, uh, looking at our, um, ourselves and seeing what exactly is going on. So we have uh, okay, Yom Kippur. There we are. For whoever is not afflicted, verse 29 says, on that day shall be cut off from his people, and whoever does any work on that day, he, I will destroy him from among his people. So it's a very, very serious day. This is the highest and holiest day in the Jewish calendar, 10 days from now on Wednesday. Uh, verse 32 says it will be a Sabbath of holy rest. You shall afflict yourselves on the ninth day of the month beginning at evening. From the evening to evening shall you keep your Sabbath. So again, the Jewish day starts at sundown. So on the ninth day at sundown begins the tenth day, and then it goes on for the entire day. That is the uh, day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. So let's come back now and look at this Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the 10-day period. That's today. And uh, we said that Rosh Hashanah means the new year. Although you might have noticed when we read through this that it says this is to occur in the seventh month. So what's going on here? How can it be the new year if it's in the seventh month? And that seems a bit odd. And to, to explain that, at least briefly, we need to go back in time a little bit in the history of Israel, uh, back to the time, the very time of the Exodus. And in Exodus chapter 12, as God was about to set the Jewish people free from their bondage, he says to Moses and to Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. The background to that is simply that Israel already had a calendar. It was the local calendar. It was based upon the, um, uh, the seasons of the year. But God said, now I'm going to give you a new calendar. And this new calendar is going to begin in the month of Nisan, which is when Passover takes place. So God told the Israelites to observe Nisan now as the beginning of the year, when Passover takes place. That was the calendar that God gave to Israel. As the, um, as the angel flew over the, the uh, land of Egypt, delivering death and destruction to the firstborn of all the Egyptians, of course, the Israelites applied the blood to the doorposts and the lintel of their homes, and the destroying angel saw that and would pass over those homes and grant protection to the Israelites. So this was so important to the Jews, such a significant event, this was to be, to be the beginning of their year. So when we come back to Leviticus 23, it says in verse 5, in the first month, which ought to be the new year, 
according to the calendar that God gave them at the Exodus. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month um, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So there seems to be some confusion going on here. God gave Israel a new year at Passover, but the Jews are celebrating Rosh Hashanah today, which should be the seventh month of the year. And here we have it again, Leviticus 23, a very specific saying that this is to be in the first day of the seventh month. God's name for this feast that is held today is not Rosh Hashanah. The name that God gave it is actually Shofarot. So most of you are familiar with the word Shofar, that's the ram's horn that is sounded as a trumpet. So the, the day that is mentioned in the Bible for today is trumpets. It's a day for the sounding of trumpets. And there's, there's, a, there's a reason for that I'm not going to go into right now. But what about this confusion about the calendar, okay? Well, there, were, there ended up being two calendars then for Israel because God gave them a new calendar at the Exodus. So there was the old traditional calendar that began in the fall. It was based on the agriculture. It was an agricultural calendar. And that was the kind of the old calendar that had been in existence for a long time. And that begins today. So they, they continued to think of this fall time as the beginning of their calendar, even though God said, I'm giving you a new calendar, which is going to begin in the springtime with Passover. So these two calendars are almost exactly 180 degrees out of sync with each other. And that is why the Jews today refer to trumpets as Rosh Hashanah, but God refers to it not as Rosh Hashanah. That expression does not occur in conjunction with this day today. What does occur in conjunction with it is the expression shofarot, or trumpets. Okay, now that's kind of trivia. Um, it's not that significant or important except to acknowledge that God gave Israel a new calendar, and they were to, to live by God's word and live according to the, the order, the pattern of life that God had given to them. So are we. Um, so here's, here's the explanation for that. So what we're looking at today, then, is, um, is shofarot. It's trumpets. And God gave Israel the Feast of Trumpets and the Ten High Holy Days, ending with the Day of Atonement, as a time to pause, to stop, and to remember. And uh, remembering is a very important part of what God has given all of his people. Sometimes we get so caught up in the busyness of our lives and our schedules and doing this and that and everything else, we just don't take time to stop and to ponder and to think and to remember. But think about the importance of remembering. Uh, God, for example, told the Israelites in Deuteronomy 4.23, take care lest you forget. Lest you forget the covenant that the Lord your, of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make a carved image or form anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. And how many believers are there today who just have let their, their commitment to the Lord fade in their memory? Um, wherefore, remember that you in times past, being Gentiles according to the flesh, and so on and so forth, but now, God, who's rich in mercy, um, we're to remember if we forget, then it has an impact on our lives, doesn't it? So we too need times to pause, reflect, remember. Deuteronomy 4.31, For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. God won't forget, and he doesn't want you to forget either. James 1, If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself, and then he goes away, and at once he forgets. Yeah. That's what we're like. It is just a description of the way we are. Uh, verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So there's a blessing that attends remembering, reflecting, and then going and doing. 
1 Corinthians 11, talking about the Lord's Supper, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. This do in what? Remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me. So it's always a challenge, you know, when we have the Lord's Supper. Something we do so often, it can easily become just a routine, right? And so um, it's a challenge to us to make this a real opportunity to remember, to remember what Christ has done for us. So we have the High Holy Days. And we're just beginning the High Holy Days today. It's a time to, to bring ourselves to a time of remembrance. So um, as we think about the High Holy Days, they begin with the Feast of Trumpets. It ends with the Day of Atonement. And so let's think about atonement and the significance of the atonement for a minute. Once a year, uh, not once a month, but once a year the Israelites remembered atonement. And they did so by having the high priest on the Day of Atonement enter into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle to sprinkle the blood of the offering on the mercy seat. So we're looking at, at a depiction of what the, um, the temple looked like roughly, tabernacle, and then later the temple it had this kind of organization and structure. You have the holy place out in front with the table of showbread and the menorah and the golden altar of incense, but behind the thick curtain was the special place, the Holy of Holies. And into the Holy of Holies, no one could go but the high priest. And he could only go once a year on the Day of Atonement. And he could not go without the offering of blood and without the incense to cover, to hide the presence of God from his face so that he would not die when he entered into the presence of God. It was an extremely holy setting. And uh, the high priest trembled greatly as he thought about the, um, uh, the prospect of entering into this holy place, the Holy of Holies. So it is right here, the Ark of the Covenant, of course, that box that Moses had constructed containing what? Ten Commandments. And? Huh? Aaron's, Aaron's rod that budded and the pot of manna. Those were the three things contained in the ark. But over the top of the ark was a very ornate lid made out of solid gold. And that lid had the two cherubim overshadowing the place where God would dwell. And they and they alone could observe that place. The high priest could go in once a year, but he had to go in with the blood had to go in with the incense. He could not see distinctly or clearly what was going on in there. He went, as it were, by faith. So uh, it reminds us about what was coming through the death of Christ, the propitiation that would be offered through Christ's blood. By the way, the, the, the um, mercy seat, that golden cover, the name that is given to that mercy seat in the Septuagint is the propitiation. Same word that we find here in the New Testament. The propitiation is the mercy seat. It's the place of meeting between God and man through the blood of the offering. Romans 3.25, whom God put forth as a mercy seat, a propitiation by his blood. Jesus Christ is our mercy seat to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. So uh, God awaiting the time of the offering of Christ, he was able year after year at the Day of Atonement to pass over those sins because the ultimate sacrifice was coming through the Lord Jesus Christ. The high priest, as it were, on the Day of Atonement looked forward to that coming of Christ. He anticipated that coming of Christ. And what was done there on the Day of Atonement, on the mercy seat, through the sprinkling of the blood, was analogous, we would say, to the offering of Christ on the cross. 1 John 2, 2 says, He, Christ, is the propitiation. He is the mercy seat for our sins. Not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. 1 John 4, 10, And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the mercy seat, the propitiation for our sins. Wow. Wow, what a great thing to pause to stop from the busyness of our schedules and all that we're doing to reflect and to remember. 
Well, on the Day of Atonement, there were two things that took place. Uh, there was much more. And if you go and, and you might want to just later on today or sometime before Wednesday, uh, read through Leviticus chapter 16. Uh, reread that precious chapter as you think about the Day of Atonement. But to summarize, there were two significant events that took place. And the first was the, the, um, uh, the offering of the blood. There were two goats that were sacrificed. One was a, a sacrifice of death, a sacrifice of blood, and the high priest would offer that blood on the mercy seat. And we've just been reading about the significance of that. But there was a second goat, and this goat uh, was taken live. The high priest would lay his hands on the head of the goat and confess all the sins of Israel, signifying a transference of the sins from the nation into the goat. And then this goat would be taken and led away into the wilderness. The Bible says for an Azazel. An Azazel. The, the word is, it has, is somewhat obscure in meaning, but it means something like a sending away. This is the goat of the sending away. Uh, many of you know that my daughter, Courtney, raises dairy goats. And she, uh, years ago, named her, her, uh, her herd and her farm Azazel to, to reflect on this sending away of sins. And it is a wonderful picture of what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in Ephesians 1.7, In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And I think one of the great, um, uh, I don't know if it's on purpose or if it's by coincidence because you have, um, uh, you have this sending away in the Old Testament. Of course, the Old Testament written in the Hebrew language. And now we come into the New Testament and we have this important word forgiveness. The interesting thing is that the Greek word translated forgiveness literally means to send away, it's a sending away. It means almost the exact same thing as the Azazel goat, which was a sending away. And uh, uh, very curious thing, you know, God on the Day of Atonement, when the high priest took this goat and led it away into the wilderness, um, some say that, that uh, the tradition among many of the rabbis is that they took it up to a cliff and, and pushed it off the cliff. But the Bible doesn't say that. But whatever happened, it was miraculous because I'll tell you, goats are animals that are herd animals. They belong to a herd and they don't like to be off by themselves. And I've often wondered in my mind, what happened when that, when that priest let that goat off into the wilderness and said, okay, go on your way. He turned around to walk home. That goat would have turned right around and followed him back. <laughs> I mean, that's just in the nature of goats. But somehow, God was able to have that goat sent away and remain away, and it symbolized the sending away of the sins. That's the forgiveness of the sins, and that is what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. So this is symbolized also in the Lord's Supper, of course. So we have the two elements, the bread and the cup. Um, the bread is a representation of the body of Christ. Uh, given for us on the cross, and we're to reflect and to remember all that happened in that body on that day. And of course, years ago, some years ago, uh, a very graphic film was produced about uh, the, the suffering and death of Christ, and a, a lot of detail went into the depiction of the, the pre-cross sufferings, the torments, and the beating, and the whipping, and so forth. We can almost overdo that in one respect, but in another respect, I think it's good to reflect on all that Christ endured on our behalf. Uh, we, can, we can glibly go over and say, well, Christ died for my sins, and I'm thankful for that, and not think, uh, reflect on all that went through the pre-cross sufferings and then the ultimate sufferings on the cross. You know, Christ was there, but I should have been there. You should have been there. That should have been you. It should have been me suffering on the cross. But he went in our place. And he says in the book of Hebrews, a body hast thou prepared for me. And uh, in the incarnation of Christ at Christmas, coming into this world, taking on a body uh, to become 
a substitute and a sacrifice for humanity. We see that in the Lord's Supper. On the Day of Atonement, we have these goats, physical depictions of living beings. One is put to death and the blood applied. The other bears the sins bodily away into the wilderness. A lot of parallels, very interesting things going on here as we think about the Day of Atonement and our celebration of the Lord's Supper. Uh, the cup, of course, representing the, um, uh, the blood. So this is the other aspect. So two things happen on the Day of Atonement. The shedding of blood and then the leading away of the Azazel goat. And I think we see both of those reflected in the Lord's Supper. And I think that this must have been in the mind of Christ, the Apostle Paul, as he wrote 1 Corinthians 11. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Remember we read earlier in Leviticus what was to happen to the man who did not observe the Sabbath on the Day of Atonement. He was to be cut off from his people. Look at the severity of not observing the time of remembrance, the time of solemnity. And Paul says, the Lord's Supper is no less solemn. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself and let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. I think Paul was thinking specifically about the high holy days as he wrote that. In preparation for the Lord's Supper, he says there is a period of introspection, of self-examination. This is what all the Jews do during these 10 days, is a time of deep reflection, introspection, confession of sins. Verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 11 says, Let a person examine himself then, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment to himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we're disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Wait, pause, remember, reflect confess. So as we, we enter into these high holy days, we have, a, we have a tremendous message. Now, I think that it's always important for us to have um, a balance in our lives. And I'm reminded that uh, of all the feasts of Israel, there's only one that is really a fast. That's the Day of Atonement. All the rest of them were times for feasting, for rejoicing, and for joy. So we can become overly introspective. That's dangerous. But we can, be, we, can, we can go to the opposite extreme and never become reflective and introspective. So we need to maintain this balance. So we need to go into a time of, of reflection, introspection, confession of sin, but don't get stuck there. We have the assurance that Christ has died for our sins, and that the blood of Christ continues to cleanse from all sin. So after that time of reflection and confession, be sure you don't get stuck there. Go on your way rejoicing, praising God, living a life of joy, the fullness of joy, in celebration of what Christ has done for us, living in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. But right now we're in the days of awe. I want to just close chapel out. We've got another five minutes. Uh, and I'm just going to um, say, let's, uh, let's spend some time in prayer. And I'm, I'm closing my message right now. But I want for us just to, to stop and to reflect, and to pray, confessing any sins we've confessed. And that will be our dismissal. When you're done praying, you get up and leave. Okay? So we're done now. And now's the time for about five minutes uh, of prayer.